Hello and welcome to another episode of Inside Marine. Today I am joined by a dynamic driven marine engineer who has progressed through the ranks from leaving school and taking on an apprenticeship in marine engineering. Uh, he has progressed through the industry, working for some of the biggest brands in the sector into finally setting up and running his own marine engineering business back in 2018, servicing some of the biggest brands and best yachts in the market. It's my absolute pleasure today to welcome director and business owner of Black Gang Marine, Mark Godden. Hi there, Mark. Hi, James. How are you? I'm really good. Thank you. I'm really, really good. good. Um, so look, Mark, you know, we, we always like to start uh, our conversations right back at the beginning. And I'm really excited to hear your story today. You, you, you've been in the industry throughout and, uh, and, and I'm personally, uh, you know, really interested and very passionate about the uh, apprenticeships and bringing in young people in, into the industry. So it, it's great to be talking to somebody who's, who's been on that journey. So, you know, take us right back. You know, how and why did you did you decide to, to join our industry? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it, it doesn't really um, stem from a decision um, at school or, uh, you know, coming out of, of college and, and not knowing what to do. It, it, it's in my blood, to be fair, and uh, it's kind of a, a replication of the stories we've had from, um, you know, some of the other guys that have, that have um, been lucky enough to do this podcast. Um, and it literally is in my blood, you know, I've got... Uh, grandparents on each side of the family that have got heavy relations to the naval you know, naval careers and and dockyard workers and stuff. Uh, we obviously live in Portsmouth. Um, we're absolutely surrounded by water and boats and boating and ships. Um, so it's just been there from a, from a very early age. Um, you know, my dad is a keen boater now and was was when I was born. So we literally were put in a Moses basket and put in the back of a a coronet and obviously off we went around the Solent with a baby and you know my brother then came along and we you know we were a family at the sea every weekend um and kind of with that you get given privileges of freedom so you know dinghies and, and walking along coastlines on the Isle of Wight at the ages of six and seven a mile from your parents you know it's just freedom um and it, and it stems right back uh which you you just can't get away from it it's it's fond memories of childhood it's this family days out, it is in you. Um, so even now, like any, any family meeting on Christmas day, no doubt, it is all boats, you know, conversations about boats, where we've been, what we're doing, um, which is kind of difficult for me because obviously Monday to Friday, I'm on them all day uh, or around them. And then uh, you don't really want to, you want to get away at the weekend. Um, but yeah, because the family is so heavily involved with it, it's just there. <laughs> yeah. That's so, fantastic. Um, yeah, it's kind of, it is, it is really a career path that, kind of led from my interests but by most most people's accounts as well i'm sure so obviously with that that uh that interest and that family interest and you know being out on the water from in the in the moses basket was it was it always a decision to actually make it a career though because a lot of people have that they have that family interest at which point did you want to and decide that you know what this is actually what i want to do yeah it was kind of a little later um so it was during the sort of senior school years i don't know what it's called now but back then it was called work experience um so you know i went out there and started asking around the family members and friends um through through a local boat club that we've been lifelong members of um in the harbor and 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 ended up getting in contact with um one of the pilot boat uh captains in the harbor that Tiggy Gold, and he still is still is there now, even, even still, and driving the pilot boats and stuff. So we managed to get set up with um, Serco, which you know operates the tugboats and the pilot boats in the harbour, um, to do my two weeks experience. So uh, I was super excited, got down there and literally spent two weeks on the tugboats, the pilot boats, everything. So we then started looking back at careers in the dockyard. Um, Serco, who you know the guys that took took me on for the for the work experience. They weren't looking for um, apprentices at that time, um, which left only really one other company, which was a company at the time called FSL, which was Fleet Support Limited. Mm. Um, I think they've since you know, defunct and become BAE and things, but they had their usual annual um, intake of apprenticeships where they bring in 250 people in to, to various interviews and tests. And we went all through that process and got offered a uh, an apprenticeship at the end of it. Um, but upon that time, that time frame, every weekend, as said, 
uh, was out on my dad's boat at the time, um, away at the weekend in cows and Yarmouth and all the rest of it, suddenly realised, I don't think I want to work on ships. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite enjoying these boats. Um, yeah. and, it, and it kind of then, again, it was another big decision to then look elsewhere and look at who and how to get into the industry. And it, it is a very difficult thing to get into. The pleasure boat industry is quite small and it's, it is very well um, woven between um, people that move from one company to another. So if you know somebody somewhere 10 years later, you will probably work with them again. And uh, again, using the, the, the connections within the, within the local boat club, um, there was a, a member that had a relative that worked at a company called Peters um, in Chichester Marina. Now, back then in 2004, um, Peters was a big fell on um, dealership. They were the biggest dealer dealership you know, in Europe, at least, if not the world. Mm. Um, so then they had a full outfit down there. So uh, we kind of saw it as a really good viable option to start a career because at that time, I wasn't sure if I wanted to be an engineer, a skipper or, you know, anything really. It wasn't really set in stone. So um, mm. we ma I managed to get an interview down there um, with uh, a chap called David Moore. Um, who was the engineering manager of the, of the Volvo Penta dealership down there at the time, which was part of Peter's. Um, and he kind of said from the outset that we've, we've already got our apprentice um, for, for that year. We've never, we've never had two apprentices. So um, come down, we'll have a chat, and we'll see possibly about taking you in next year. Mm -hmm. So um, off I went <laughs> yeah. down to this shipyard. I'll say shipyard, you know, a boatyard. Um, and uh, met David, and I think we we got on really well. Uh, David sort of dragged me around the company to introduce me to to a Brian Shell down there at the time, who was running the yard, and a Bob Bud, who was also uh, got senior management down there. Mm. Um, and came away from that that initial meeting with an offer, and that offer was for an apprenticeship. So that's how, and that's the first steps into. Um, the, the pleasure boat sector if you like and and obviously david you know saw something in you that he really liked at the time and, and at that point there was obviously that interest but not necessarily the the, the all the practical skills that they that they may have you know needed at the time to warrant maybe a, an extra apprentice or to yeah, that's right. plan that much but i mean how you know, for, you know how important do you think that is that that the, the key people in the industry really need to be constantly right looking out for these these these, these hungry really keen uh, younger people and you know literally dragging them which is the word you use into their businesses and 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 dragging them into the industry because you also said it's back then certainly um there was a little bit of a barrier into the marine industry from a from the career yeah, from, a, from a careers advice point of view but david actually sort of you know kind of really help help you out with that i did you know if you know he i think uh if it wasn't for him i would probably have took up the um offer with fsl in the dockyard mm, okay. um and quite you know quite funnily it not funny in a way but Literally three or four weeks after accepting the apprenticeship role um, with Peters, FSL um, announced in the local news that they were laying off you know, 50, 60 engineer, you know, engineering background staff. So, you know, it was one of the concerns I had was it the dockyard and the, the maritime sector you know, or the support side of the ships in the dockyards are very much contract based. So they will they will take on 200 people from the city and and then slash their workforce at the drop of a hat, depending on contracts. Um, yeah. And it kind of it kind of got me away from that idea, and then got me into 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 um, the, the mindset of getting into the the pleasure pleasure side. And if it wasn't for David, you know, getting the the management above him and around him convinced that this guy should be with us, then I probably wouldn't have done it. Um, and it, it is it is critical for for companies like that um, and my own. To, to take on apprentices um you know there's a massive gap at the moment obviously I, i'm looking at um trying to recruit more skilled and high you know highly skilled uh, specifically skilled if you like towards our, our our disciplines um personnel and it's so difficult because there's a massive gap i mean there's so many that are sort of 50 to 60 um that did apprenticeships in their time 
Um, and then there's this huge gap between that and, and an influx now of, of fourth year apprentices coming out of their work, you know, their work um, roles, looking for work. And in the middle of that, you've got you've got myself who, who's who's 35, um, and you know I can't really in the, in the roles I've had, most of the staff around me have been 20 years older um, or an apprentice. So so there's big there's 10 year gaps between between what it looks like um, uh, deviations in how people have left school and what careers they've got into. Um, you know, when I left school, it was very much heavily pushed towards A levels. And, and to be honest, I went and done the first year of AS levels at course of college. So between leaving school in that time of, of looking at what to do and going to the career meetings um, with, with the Maritime um, University, I was actually doing A levels at college for a year. So I actually went from school into, into um, you know, further education, um, studied physics, maths, IT and design and got a year into it and thought, this is not for me. And obviously that was when the relationship also came into it, a home life as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you want to progress in life and the apprenticeship offered that with their, their slogan at the time was earn as you learn. And we, obviously as I got into the, the role at Peter's, um, I was lucky enough to still live at home and be well supported and we, we basically saved up my entire apprenticeship salary minus mm. you know c commuting fees and bought a house mm. so within within six months of finishing apprenticeship uh, amy and i bought our first house which really gave us a, you know in life gave us the first start really and that was only really because of the apprenticeship and we, we kind of moved into our own property 10 years before our friends did that were in university, you know, even now there's, we've got friends that have just, just sort of bought their first property in their mid thirties and have taken career routes into university on courses that led to a different in, in the, in the end left to a different uh, career path. Mm. Um, and it kind of stems back to that whole, you must go to college, you must go to university um, and you'll do really well. But, but there is a massive amount of people that, that can do really well without any of those factors. Um, mm. And obviously, for my, my career path, I, I took on the apprenticeship route, um, built heavily on my skill and experience after that with the companies that I worked for, which we'll lead on to, mm. and then propelled out of that after sort of, as I put it, doing my time for them um, with life skills, you know, financial um, set up to allow me to set a business up on my own, you know, finances, all based from an apprenticeship. Yeah, so no, obviously I thank, really David, thank David for that and all of the staff mm. at Peters that, um, sadly, which we'll get on to, are no longer there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So well, uh, I think it's, um, it, you know, your your story is such a great kind of case study for why apprenticeships are so important and the opportunity you can get with them. Do we as an industry do enough to promote the pathways after an apprenticeship because we see a lot of activity around apprenticeships and you know a lot of you know you know definitely activity of getting people onto them and promoting what the the apprenticeship is but do we do enough to actually promote the the journey after that and what the opportunity is one of the things you said which i found quite interesting was when you were looking at the police for example you sort of we're in that forward mindset of like, I could join the police, but actually where I'd really like to end up is in the Marine division. And that is, is a really, you know, that's a really small chance of that. So yeah. kind of that foresight, if you like, do we, are we giving enough of the, the you know, in the apprenticeships enough foresight and information and, and, and journey uh, to let, get them interested enough? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult for me because obviously uh, uh, where I've gone from, I've obviously gone down that route and, and I've now set up my own business. My only real um, connection to that is the fact that I've taken on my own apprentice. Mm. Now, obviously, from a business point of view, you've got to be in a certain position to do that. Um, and f for me, um, ever since I was an apprentice um, and you've just touched on it there where obviously with the early idea of becoming a, you know, a Marine division police officer, um, I was always looking ahead to, to see where that job role would lead. And obviously that would have me working in the police force for years and years, probably unhappy chasing something that might not happen. That would ultimately be in someone else's hands. 
Um, so obviously taking the apprenticeship route for me um, enabled me to then create my own career path. So that at the end of my apprenticeship, um, I had I had my qualification, I had the skill set to be able to move around the industry or even switch over to a different industry. But obviously, with with joining certain career paths, um, and we've even with the you know naval routes and stuff, you start off on a, on a path, and, and the path's already laid out. Mm. Um, whereas with an apprenticeship, you're learning a skill. You know, you're learning life skills. You're learning how to work around other people with other skills and other backgrounds. Mm which ultimately enables you to, to have a career mm. in, in any sector that has the same transferable skills. So, so for me, like I thought it was really, I knew it was important to get an apprentice involved because obviously everything I do um, on the vessels and on, on the work we do can, can easily be transferred to somebody else if they've got that interest um, mm. and, and knowledge obviously can build from there. So, Taking on an apprenticeship apprentice for me um, was an easy decision. It was just a very difficult thing to get to because ultimately when I first started Black Gang Marine, it was just myself and a van um, mm. and tools. And that, that is that's the only way you can start a business in our, in our sector. You know, everything's paid after. So we do the work and we get paid. And then anything that's left in that job, mm. you can either take home um, and put it into your you know, enjoyment in life or you can, you can put it back into the business. So after spending the spending the last three years, ultimately reinvesting where, wherever I can, mm -hmm. it, it led me to be able to to take on an apprentice, um, and 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 in order to do that, you, you know, we've had to have an office, you know, we've had to have an address, we've had to have um, a clientele base that's that's loyal and supportive, which they are, um, and then it, it enables me to then spend the time. And efforts and investment in in, in supporting Charlie, who, who is our engineer and apprentice. I mean, would, would you say that uh, you know, at, 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 at a general level, there, you know, the apprenticeship, I suppose, scheme is is really really working for our industry, or is there some fundamental changes that that we we should probably be looking at? Yeah, I think I think it stems back to interest as well, as in mm. you know that the the younger generations now what they aspire to be and what they aspire to do is very much based on in some and most situations the unattainable you know the the, the the social media stuff that's out there that you know most people if you mentioned pleasure boats or or boats or marine industry they're probably used to looking at um you know stunning high resolution videos all over mm -hmm. social media platforms of super yacht life and you know, all these things that are there, but th th there's a big gap between not knowing how to get in the industry and what they see the industry is. Whereas yeah. if we can try and like introduce younger people uh, into boating at a younger age, that's realistic, you know, not, not super yachts in, in the middle of the Mediterranean, because yeah, ultimately that is a different sector altogether to what's going on in the Solent. Yeah. So th there's, th th there's opportunities there to get people into boating and, you know, I think that the um, stand-up paddleboard and kayaking, like, it's just exploded down here in the last 18 months or so because of, um, you know, leisure activities being affected by COVID and, mm. you know, the, the restrictions on doing things. And people, a lot of people did go out and buy stuff that they can go and do on the water. Mm. And we, we've seen a massive influx influx in people buying smaller boats that have had a paddleboard or a kayak and have explored, you know, the, 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 the top of the handle and, ports of harbour and stuff by water and it's kind of then giving them an interest into boating and they've got yeah you know, they've got children you know there's people that you know that i can think of that have then gone and bought kayaks for their kids and mm. you know it's those it's those young you know 12 to 16 year olds that yeah. need to come into the industry that have got an interest in 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 the local boating scene because ultimately that you know there is a discipline in this um if, for me to send my apprentice to a boat um, just to go and pick something up from the owner or to meet one of my engineers on the boat. He has to he has to be presentable and present himself in a certain way because he is at the forefront of our business. So he's in front of the client. You know, he's not he's not in a a hangar or a workshop or an assembly line or you know production line at uh, say a big, yeah. big company. So if he's got a general interest or that person has got a general interest in boating, they can hold a conversation really well. Um, and it just creates, you know, opportunities for them and us um, that may have not been there if they hadn't been introduced to it at a young age.
Yeah, definitely. So, because I, I talk on the podcast a bit about the, uh, I guess, the business opportunity that we have at the moment as an industry with this new interest, you know, in, in oh, yeah. at the paddleboarding level. And, um, but actually, I think you're right from a skill shortage point of view, next generation point of view. Actually, the opportunity isn't just from a business point of view, but it is from a, a, a talent and, and a next generation of, apprentices or people considering the industry more so yeah that is something that we absolutely need to be um you know jumping on i i, I guess as an industry yeah definitely i think you know there, there are you know all of us and people need um you know recognition and, and targets and stuff and the apprenticeships do that um throughout their you know various ways and you know there, there's different pay structures for different, completing different parts of the courses and stuff but um, there are things that the industry could be doing to recognise more of the people that stand out, the, you know, the, 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 the young men and women that put in extra effort to, to get past what would normally be a normal apprenticeship. And I think, you know, some of that will come into effect with regards to the environment and stuff. And, you know, the, the younger, the younger um, generations, and, and which is going to be our future workforce and future boat owners, will ask questions and they will be stronger um, in defining what, you know, what, what the business they work for should be doing. Um, and even at an apprenticeship level, um, they will, you know, these, these guys and girls will be coming in um, with a far, far stronger opinion on, on what the business is doing um, and how the business conducts, uh, you know, its work and how it maintains and looks after its staff. Mm. Um, and they will, they will be driving, our, our direction really mm. um so you know we have to be so mindful and, and and understanding of what apprentices need and what they expect from us because ultimately they are our future yeah and i don't think people realize this you know that it's okay building beautiful boats and and uh you know creating technologies and, and equipment that's efficient and works well but ultimately you're going to need the apprentices to install them you're going to need the apprentices to, to look after them and uh, it kind of leads you on to a point I was going to make later on. It, you know, there's lots of new technology coming through, which is drastically different. And it is, you know, a lot of it is coming in quicker than what any of us would have expected 10 years ago. Uh, and it obviously does lead towards cleaner, um, non-fossil fuel, you know, propulsion systems, and cl cl cleaner energy systems as well, onboard systems. Um, and th these people are going to be expected to work on those in the future. Um, mm. and that they're going to have an interest in that because it's everywhere, you know, it's around them. It's in their, it's in their education. It's in their you know, social activities. It's, it's everything. So mm. they will be expected to work on them and they will be, you know, there for us if we can get them in, in, in the right training schemes. Yeah. You know, there's so many really key points in, in everything that you've just said there. And, but ultimately, it's kind of the responsibility is, you know, from all of us in the industry to, to recognize that not just the issues that we have right now, but actually the opportunities we have right now with, with bringing in the, 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 the next people and, you know, uh, and lining that with the, the challenges that we have around the, the technology. And, you know, there's, um, you know, I, I want to talk a bit about, you know, your, your career journey and, you know, you've, you've clearly kept that progressing all the way through yeah, yeah. brilliant companies you've been you've done some good good stints at, at the companies that you've been in and but you, you know the clear you clearly continue to progress and you know over the years you would have seen technology changing and and, and that sort of thing um but i'm really interested in, in you know in your motivation on the on the progression and, and and what do you put that down to what yeah so obviously I've done the Holy Trinity. <laughs> so, um, throughout my career, uh, I've been made redundant. Um, I've been, I've, I've sourced, secured, um, and moved to another job uh, mm. to better myself. Um, and then I've done the other side of it, where I've got, uh, I've been asked to leave or it's technically sacked for gross misconduct. So I, I've personally been through a whirlwind of emotions and and uh, a roller coaster, if you like, through through the career. That it, some of it's my own, you know, my own doing, and other and other other sectors are not. 
um, you know, at the back of the apprenticeship um, in the last uh, year of my apprenticeship. So literally, uh, you know, got my certification qualification within two weeks, um, the business folded. So, so there I was, you know, about to buy a house, as I mentioned to you, the money was in the bank for the deposit, you know, all that was done, ready to go off the back of working hard for three years. Um, and uh, there you are with no job. So, you know, I had an apprenticeship behind me, I had the piece of paper, three years of hard work behind me for them, um, and obviously the investment from them into me, um, and a piece of paper. Mm. So uh, that was number one, that's the redundancy. Um, and then it was the case of having to say, well, okay, here we go again, let's go and find the job. Um, and, you know, you, you, the difficulty there, um, when you've got an entire boatyard, which is one of the biggest marine businesses around, multi-trade, multi-sector uh, skill set, you've got technically 100 people within a week applying to all the other industry you know, companies looking for a job. So I secured a couple of interviews, um, but I was competing against you know, six or seven seasoned engineers with you know, a lot of knowledge and a lot more experience behind them than me. Um, but I wasn't looking for an apprenticeship job because I was qualified. So I was stuck in this sort of like doldrums of, I was known for being a good apprentice, but I've not been employed as an engineer yet. So a couple of the job interviews were quite difficult because where there were two or three weeks after the, the redundancy and the big news that the, the business had failed, half of the interview, so this is two different companies, they were spent mostly asking about the business that I just left and what, what that, what, you know, how that happened. Um, and then where are the other engineers? As in, where's, you know, where, where's this chap gone? Who's this? Where's he, you know, it's kind of, you come away thinking, well, that wasn't easy. And that was just the situation that I was in. Um, but thankfully, um, a local company who's grown substantially since then um, took me on as an engineer. So, you know, I had the qualification, they recognized that I was good at what I'd done, but, and they took me on and, and that was Golden Arrow in Southampton. So, at the back of a redundancy, um, John Smith, who owns Sultans Marina and the, and the, you know, the Golden Arrow Group, um, along with Martin Bazell, obviously saw potential in me and, and, and employed me. Um, so I kind of bounced off of the, the, the negative of the redundancy into a really well-supported job role um, with a company which you know, grew, grew massively while I was there um, and had lots of training and, and, and experience from that. So they were kind of like the second building block for me, really. Um, and as with anything, you know, if you look back through my CV, all of my job roles have been good stints. You know, it's, they, they invested into me and I, and I put the massive effort into them. Um, but all, all the way through that, there was always always this thinking of one day when the time's right, it, it, it will be something that I need to do for myself. And mm. it's really it's really difficult to get, to, to get through life if you've got something in your head telling you what you, there's something that you the more that you want to do and uh i always knew what it what it was i wanted to do i just didn't know one how to do it and secondly when the right time was because you need the experience and you need the knowledge um and the reputation to make the transition from from employment to self-employment so um funny enough saw an advert with, with you guys some eight, nine years ago now for, for Princess. Um, so obviously contacted yourselves and you put me in line with with um, a chap called Peter Harwood down there, um, who, that, who then I obviously went down for an interview and met. Um, and he was very keen um, at the time on, on my engineering background, because obviously um, traditionally at that time, their, their after service department um, used contractors. So it was a small outfit in Sonic Marina um, and it was literally heavily reliant on OEM contractors, uh, you know, doing warranty work and things. So they needed a technician, which by their standards back then was a, you know, about a stern guy that could find faults, fix things and uh, rectify them. Um, and it kind of rolled on from there. We, we went into the interview and, and discussed other things. And he, he said, I'm really interested in, in your background at Golden Arrow and obviously at Peter's back, back, back in your apprenticeship. Because as a business, we're looking to move towards more internal um, engineering support. Mm. So I did really well in the interview and, 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 and got offered the job and, and took the job and then obviously left Golden Arrow, which wasn't easy for them or, or me. I think, uh, you know, the guys down there, um, John Smith and, and Martin, had me sort of lined up for 
you know, management roles and possibly ultimately taking on a, a higher role at, at Golden Arrow um, mm. later on. And um, obviously they tried to convince me to stay, but it, it just, it was time to go. Um, and uh, the door, the door, the door with them was always left open. So um, it, at my time at Princess, I always knew if, if if it wasn't working out, and I wanted to get off my tools or I became ill, as in you know physically, because it's still a physical job at that point. I could go back there. Um, so we kind of parted ways and got and got into Princess really. And yeah. this is when the business side of me started to to, to wake up because as I came into Princess, um, I was quite a key figure in, 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 you know, moving their after sales side along. Um, it took me, um, you know, a year to convince Peter to, to give me to service a generator. Now, obviously I, I spent the best part of 12 years stripping engines, building engines, installing engines in, in far away places. And, uh, mm. it, it took me a while to, to get him to get me to get into involved in their new boats and service some of this stuff, you know? So it didn't take too long, and before you know it, we were, we were taking on big jobs um, internally. So we were taking out engines um, and, and repairing them inside their, their workshop at the time um, on, on you know used and broken broken boats, which was unheard of before before then. I kind of done it again a good good level of work abroad for them, um, big project stuff, and, and you know boat shows I was involved with. Um, mm. But again, it was putting me in front of the owner and client. So. Yeah. It got to the point where I was doing everything for that job or that client, um, apart from sending an invoice or the quote. So it kind of at that point, I thought, well, I think now's the time. Um, now I sort of hit early thirties, and and uh, we'd had three children while at Princess, and I think that has a big effect, you know, effect in life. You have children, and it kind of puts a time frame on life that you never expected, mm. and it kind of triggered me to think, you know. I need to do so. I need to do something about this voice in my head now, <laughs> <laughs> and I need to, I need to do it because if I don't do it now, um, mm. I'm not gonna. If it does well and, and and it gets to where I want it to get to, I'm not gonna enjoy um, the, the fruits of it. And, and and in the fruits of it, it's not financial for me. It's more the time. So mm. to, to set a business up, um, you know, there's three factors. Do, you know, do you set a business up to earn good money? Do you set a business up to have more time away from earning money? So effectively set a business up so that it can, op it can operate itself one day with smaller input. Um, or do you, or do you, uh, sorry, or do you set a business up um, for uh, the purpose of being proud of something? Now they all have to work together because there's no point in setting a business up to not be proud of it because then the, the dedication and the drive disappears. It needs to make money. Um, and it needs to enable you to to do something different to being employed, and that is eventually having more time at home. So it kind of it kind of got the, the, the clock ticking for me, thinking, well, you know, the kids are, are, are really young, um, and you know, they're not going to be young forever. And uh, it, it kind of re really triggered me off on that on that on that path. Um, so you know, in my in my late later sort of few months at Princess, um, it was kind of how do, how do I how do I finance it? how do I get clients um, and how do I uh, manage it around personal life? Um, Cause I, I try to plan everything I do. And, and, and that, that was a real big one for me. And it, I had to sit down and, and look at business plans and, and look at things that as an engineer, I've never had to look at before. Um, mm. You know, it, it's such a complex field at first, but once you start putting things down on paper um, and then you start to realize, actually, this is viable. I can do this. Uh, and, you, and you literally build a business plan um and then start putting the pieces in place and the first one obviously is finances so we we were lucky enough as i said to you to buy a house early on in life which effectively is led from an apprenticeship um start started career um we we sold that property and moved back in with our um with my wife's parents who again are, are as supportive as my as my family and my, and, and my wife mm. so we lived there uh, in the last year of my um princess days um while we rented out the other house and then eventually sold it uh to buy the house that we're in now um mm. and in between those two we kept some finances back um to effectively start the business and that was really a van 
um, some efforts in, in doing it properly from the outset. So obviously we, we went straight in as a limited company, um, VAT registered, because I kind of thought, well, if things go well within the first year or two, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go that way anyway. So we literally, rather than it being a self-employed status, it was literally a limited yeah. company with one employee, which was myself. And I think one of the, um, that's really, really interesting. And it sounds like, you know, the, the, um, going through those last years in, in, in golden arrow and, and in princess and that kind of being, uh, it, it, within businesses that were showing growth, yeah. clearly that, you know, the ambition and the voice in your head saying that you want to work for yourself is, is with a vision of actually having a business, which is to grow as opposed to, kind of just being working for yourself with the van. And, and of course you've got to start there, but I, th you know, how, how important is it if you, and when you start to have that longer term vision, so you know, from the beginning, what you need to be focusing on, because actually running a business or just working for yourself is two separate things. And, and both are not for everyone, right? No, that's right. And obviously com coming out of, of that mindset and, um, you know, it, it, you're trying to um, work a nine to five job with, with, and being told to travel at short notice with a young family. So I was spending a lot of time in hotels around the world and effectively, eventually the final um, uh, decision was made really when I was in St. Lucia of all places for Princess and was trying to um, decide between uh, a job offer that came in from Golden Arrow um, as a service as a service manager, um, between staying where I was with Princess. And the, there was two options there at the time. It was stay where I was or take on this service manager role. But all the while, before that and leading into it, I had already started looking at going on my own. Mm. So, again, that was a big trigger point for me and say, right, this is it now. We're going we're gonna to do this. Um, and, it, and this is what, what, why and where... Um, the holy trinity of employment status completes itself. Uh, so anyway, we got, we got into that and um, that was it. I was off and, you know, I was every night into the office at home and looking at how to do this. Um, and th this is where it went a bit wrong for me. And this is where the regrets are. Um, so obviously from a, from a business point of view and an owner, it is always good to look back and mm -hmm evaluate where things were what happened and and and, and uh try and readjust <laughs> the course mm. um so at that at the decision of, of deciding to do my own thing um as i said to you you look at finances you look at clients and you look at um the plan so finances were kind of sorted to get me set up uh and then it was kind of clients now obviously when you're working for a company like princess you know, you've got access in person to big clients. Um, and regrettably, uh, you kind of, I kind of cross the line between um, working for them and becoming um, kind of, I wouldn't say friends because friends and work friends are different, but you, you become acquaintances where, you know, you'll happily answer the phone on a Sunday um, to talk them through a problem. And Princess was quite happy with that because obviously it's a really great, tool for you know service and customer relations but you end up becoming like um a support for them almost external to, to, to your employment role um so you, obviously as a, a business plan early on you think well these clients are there um are they going to be interested in working for me with me etc um so it's quite it's quite a difficult one uh because it's all right putting the finances in and it's all right putting the time in to build a business but are, are, are you going to have the work mm. so regrettably the decision was made by myself um to try and facilitate that and talk to to the clients and see if they'd be interested in in working for me and i think this is obviously from my point of view this is a big um topic in my career as well as um the people that i've worked for previously um and it's probably the first time I've talked about it, really, because uh, there's been no, no, no looking back. I haven't had a chance to. You just can't. Obviously, once you set a business up, you, you have to just move on. Um, and I think coming out of that situation where I contacted clients, spoke to the clients, um, ultimately the, the you know, princess found out that I was looking to leave 
Um, and obviously I'd done a few things I shouldn't have done with regards to contacting people via, you know, email addresses and stuff, which ultimately from, from, from that side of things, they have to react, um, and, uh, you know, pull me in for, uh, you know, the, the meeting, um, with Peter, regrettably, you know, Peter put a lot of time and effort into, into employing me and supporting me. And, uh, yeah, there he is in front of me without any question was going to have to let me go. And in, in hindsight, if I'd have just spoken to them and said, look, I've had this feeling for 10 years. I want to do my own thing. You know, it, it's going to be viable. I'm looking to be local in Portsmouth as opposed to down here on Swanwick in Swanwick. And, uh, I think, mm. you know, it would have, it would have still taken its same path. Um, yeah. but I wouldn't feel the need to, to try and avoid their boat show stand or, you know, mm. find it hard to talk to, to, to people about it. Cause it ultimately it was, it was a mistake by myself, mm. which kind of tarnished my name, you know, for a while I'd, I spent 15, 20 years building up a reputation of being trusted, you know, highly skilled, dependable engineer. And then all of a sudden, obviously my name, and the new company name was thrown in in with discussions of you know gross misconduct and and um you know it could have been quite bad for us really you know it was at a time when um data protection was really hot because of the eu and you know the particular situation unraveled that you know someone had, had complained that i had contact with them and it could have been quite nasty really but well i i, I think um I, you know, I, I, am ambition and, uh, and, and drive can, um, really kind of get you focusing on things. And, and I think it's, I think yeah. it's, it's really great that you've come on here today. We've been really honest and you clearly, you know, clearly regret some of that. And, oh, nice. um, yeah. uh, but, uh, I, I think it's, um, I think it's uh, admirable that you sort of use the platform just to kind of highlight yeah, I mean, that and, and bring that. And, and, and actually, I think there's, there's, you know, people who are considering yeah. running their own businesses and, and how you would approach that. I think there's some, yeah. some great advice there in, in terms of maybe how to, how to approach it. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, like, like I say, uh, to, to be successful, in anything, it doesn't matter if it's business um, or uh, a job role or, or building something. If it's an engine that you're assembling, um, you've got to look back at what went wrong. Yeah. So if something breaks, so if, if an engine breaks down or something sinks, which hasn't happened by the way with us, <laughs> um, <laughs> if something isn't right, um, whether it, you know an employment contract is 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 terminated, such as my own, you have to look back and see what went wrong with that and. Um, you know, the mechanics were there for it to go wrong. Um, it's just as a, as a new business owner, uh, or the potential of a new business owner, I didn't really understand how to get out. Mm. So obviously in hindsight, if I'd gone back to my employer and said, oh, you kind of have fear that they're going to ask you to leave and you know, you're going to, you're, you know, you're going to do this. So we just want you to go. Mm. And you, you kind of sat on the fence because although you've done a lot of planning and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of for, for work to get to get to that point. Sometimes you need to push. And if I'd gone in and spoke to, to Peter and, and higher management and, and discussed that, they may very well have said, look, you know, it's fantastic. We want to work with you still. You know, we, we're more than happy to bring you in as a subcontractor because we trust you and we trust your work. And if I'd done that and had that conversation, then the whole early years of my business, wouldn't I wouldn't feel there's a shadow over any of it. Mm. Um, so ultimately, you know, moving forward now, uh, it, with anything, we're just open, you know, if I've, yeah. if I've got a client that comes to me with, and is asking us to do something and as a business, you think, well, this is, this could be quite good, but it's not something that we've really done before. I will be open with them and say, look, mm. you know, yes, we could do it, um, but we, this will be the first time we've done it. Mm. And it's that, it's that honesty now that, that, that kind of supports the business. And it, it, I say, regrettably, if I'd done that early on, then, then I wouldn't have had, um, the first year sort of doubts that I had before. Um, but it kind of, like I say, it kind of pushed me down that road. Mm. And if there is people that are you know, thinking of doing the same thing and see, see my business as being, you know, relatively recently successful and being able to grow, start well at the start <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh, understand that these people that have got you to where you are have trusted you and you know built you as a as a, as a person and as a mm. as a, you know as a um as an employee um and it was you know so it was kind of it was a regrettable time of my year of, of my life but equally it's, it was a spark of 
of having to pick the pieces up and get on with it. Um, yeah. And there's been a few of them because obviously, as we all know, with the COVID and, and lockdowns and, and that has not been easy for, for, from, from a young business point of view as well. But, yeah. yeah. Well, I think from, from, any, from any, the, any, any business that's been able to, um, I guess, navigate the last yeah. you know, few years uh, is in is in great shape for, for the future. And I, and I think, you know, coming on to the future in, in a moment, you know, somebody uh, wiser than me once, t- once told me that, you know, if, whenever, if you ever recognize that you've made a mistake, uh, but you can learn from it and, and, and work out what you do differently next time, then actually, you know, that's uh, that. That's actually that's an important important way to look at it. So, um, so what it, so so to just going very quickly to, to to the future. You know, Black Gang Marine. We, we've 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 got through the la, la, last the, the tricky the tricky couple of years. Um, the, the which tricky years also setting up the business. You know, you're you're hiring. Your you, you things to be going well. What what's what's um what's next for for, for Black Gang Marine? What's next for you? Yeah, I mean, I mean, just quickly, James, like. You know, the, the last eighteen months we could spend five, six hours talking about. Um, it, it's, it's a lot of <laughs> maybe we'll need a part two. <laughs> unbelievable! It takes a lot of effort to go from somebody in their van um, through a pandemic uh, to come out of the pandemic period uh, with five employees, uh, three more vehicles, um, you know, a well-established office with showroom uh, and some products uh, that we're now dealing with through partners, um, which is now building up a, you know, a retail platform for us, um, which will enable us to support, you know, branded items that are installed in boats. It takes a lot of effort to get through that and to get to that point, which we've got to. Um, and yeah, obviously coming out of that, you, you kind of think, well, you know, we, we now, we've now got there, you know, I can now sit here and talk to you and not have, clients wondering what I've done today, how I fixed their boat, if I've done it or not, how much it costs. So like there's people now that can deal with that for me, mm. um, which then kind of gave me a kind of an area. There's always, there's always something that I need to do. And it's always from about 8 PM till about 1130 at night. There's always something to do. And where I've done that and obviously source these people and set them up, it kind of left a gap to me to sort of like sit back and actually look at where this is going and what we're doing. Mm. Um, and you, you are, you know, you are a product of your environment and we are surrounded by, um, in every form of life at the moment, you know, not just in our industry, then the need to protect the planet. Now, I know, I know that you, you, a lot of your uh, previous um, interviewees, if you like, uh, touched on this massively because they are obviously at the higher end of the, of the industry and have to, to, to manage whole departments for this. But obviously on a smaller level, You've got to react. You've got to. You've got to sit there and think. Okay, th- this ha- we have to change as people. The industry has to change. Uh, how do we do that? You know, f- from my point of view, I've kind of had to look and, and, and look at how I can have an impact. Now, I can't go and design the next hydrogen engine, or um, you know, I just I don't have that uh, you know background. I haven't got the. I'm not a scientist. I don't have the the multi billion or million pound industry behind me or, or company. So how, how, do I, how do I make a positive impact? Now, you kind of have to look at what we do. We look after diesel engines, propulsion, um, and, and systems and equipment that, it, that is pretty much unchanged apart from emissions for the last 20, 30 years. So how, how do we change? If, if I shut down what we did tomorrow and started in a new direction, it wouldn't, it's not sustainable, you know, as a business, it, w- it, wouldn't, it wouldn't work. So we have to look at how, we, how, how to, to uh, approach that. So my clients take advice from us and they, they, our clients come to us for support. So they will quite often go to a boat show, they'll go online, they'll see an effort, you know, or, or a news article uh, about a new product or a new, a new um, you know, type of technology. And they, they won't go towards that unless they've got support. So mm. you can kind of take take away from that, like, like at home. So are we going to buy electric? All of us are going to buy an electric car tomorrow? No. You know, you've got to have the support around the electric cars. You've got to have the charging points. You've got to be able to charge them on the street. They need to possibly charge themselves with higher efficient uh, solar panels on the roof so that you park it up somewhere for a week and the battery's fine. And it's exactly the same in boating. You know, 
people have been in boating mostly for, for, for decades and they, they used to fill their, their boats up with fuel and disappearing for a week and then coming back on the same fuel almost. So how do, how do, we, how do we help that? So if we can build um, a division within our own company that can promote support and educate our staff towards these products, when our clients are talking to us about them, we're already there. You know, we, if we've got somebody that's wanting and looking at buying a new boat next year and it's got an electric motor rather than an engine and it's got a generator in the back to support the lithium power bank, they're going to they're gonna wonder who's going to look after that for them. So they're going to they're gonna speak to me if, they, if, they, if we've looked after their boat for years. And if I, if I was on the, on the understanding that we didn't know anything about that and we would say all things towards, you know, not allowing them to be in that position to buy that, without our support they're gonna, they're not going to buy it. you know they're going they're going they're going to consider keeping with the older technology and they're going they're going to come back with a new boat with a diesel engine in that we can look after if we can facilitate the future by looking after them with the newer technology we can help move people away from that product to, to the newer products Mm. And they'll feel confident in buying it next year because this, you know, the year after or that year, we, we're there for them. Well, I think, I think you know, going through our conversation today and, and hearing about the journey and, and one of the, the things that stands out is your, your great sort of foresight and, and ambition. You know, uh, if I was a betting man and we know that the, in, the industry is, is doing in the direction that it is, that, that that would no doubt be a hugely successful part of, of your business, uh, the right way to go. And, and obviously with your, your ambition and drive behind it, I, I think that's going to be a really exciting uh, new you are on to our industry in the future and you know you can circle that right back to what we talked about at the beginning around you know the new skills that are going to need needed in these technologies and and it all links up really nicely with with, with bringing you know building the interest and, and getting getting uh getting new generations of, of people in you know in, into our industry um so uh, you know we wish you all the all the luck with that so just to finish off the the discussion i always ask my guests one final question and we've actually talked a lot about uh you know people getting into the industry and and how important that is but if you could give one piece of advice to somebody considering joining our industry or who have just joined our industry, what would it be? So, so for me, and this is based on my um, career to date, uh, and obviously I've had time to think about this and I've, I've kind of come up with what's got me to where I am. Um, and that is my, my advice to anyone, whether they're an apprentice, uh, sorry, apprentice in their first year or they're coming out of their apprenticeship, or even if they're, you know, two or three years in, into, into the, into their sort of engineering career or similar skill set is to approach everything with dedication and determination to do the absolute best you can. So whether it's an interview for a new role, you know, or installing a piece of equipment or simply present yourself to a colleague um, or a potential employer, you need, you need to consider everything. So just every aspect of the lead up to that, whether it's, you know, dressing yourself, getting out the door, looking smart, getting into the into the job or getting into the, um, the 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 task at hand is take pride in what you're doing you know people are going to judge you on what you do <clears throat> and they will look at what you work they'll look at you as a person and what you you know it will leave you and lead you on on the right path um, and you know you have to do this every day because it, it ultimately it builds your reputation as a person and the reputation of the business you work for mm. So you, you just have to like, dedicate yourself every every aspect of what you do, and I, I try this in, in everything I do. If, if it's a you know taking on uh, create, creating a new email banner uh, or something, you know it has to be right, and I won't let anything go until I am happy with it. And that's the same with jobs as well. So yeah. any, anything we do, is, you have to be happy with it. Yeah. Great. Uh, uh, some, some wonderful advice throughout this whole discussion. And, and, and that absolutely is, is some real gold just, just to finish it off. So Mark, it's been brilliant talking to you today. Uh, I, and I wish you all the best uh, with, with Black Gang Marine. It sounds like there's some super exciting plans uh, afoot. And, um, you know, it'll be really great to, to get you back uh, and hear about how all that's going on in, in the near future. Yeah, of course. Thank you, James. Thanks then, Mark. Good luck. Thank you.